and we will start dot at six o'clock. <clears throat> okay, so right now we are live. We are just waiting for two more minutes. Uh, uh, Julfi, can you have the full screen, please? Yeah, that's what I'm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the display is the full screen. Uh, still, your slides are coming. It's on the not screen. clicking. One minute. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That. That right. Okay. Can you share the link uh, for the viewers so that they can see? Uh, are you are, are you putting it on the Facebook? Like, yes. Yeah, many people are asking. Yeah, can for we the also link. share the link in uh, Slack group and uh, AIMS alumni group? Yeah, yeah, we will do once we once we start. Yes, we will start. Uh, we now you can put that link the... in the private chat. I will just share it. Uh, okay. Uh, wait, I am uh, WhatsApping you, Kunaya. Right. Yeah. Okay. That link. <clears throat> Okay, here it is. Right. Okay, got it. The tunnel in the Facebook, the link is not working. Ask somebody to no, check it whether it is. So is it working? No, it's working. Yeah, it's working. Uh, I can see. Yeah, it. I can watch. Yes, yes, yes. yes yeah. Okay, we are live on Facebook right now. Okay, another one minute to start. And, uh, Okay, uh, so it's time to start. Uh, okay, a very good evening to all the viewers. Uh, basically, it's a very proud and privileged moment for me. And uh, it's a real nice gesture on the part of the Neuroanesthesia and Critical Care Society to team up with the Anesthetist Society so that uh, they can tell uh, what are the career and training prospects of a neuroanesthesiologist in India. Uh, so let me start with uh, introducing all the panelists. And we are joined by Dr. Poneya. He is the director of neuroanesthesia in MGM uh, Hospital Chennai, also the secretary of ISNAC. Uh, it's a very proud moment for me because uh, he, he, is my, he was my junior also in uh, post-graduation and uh, one of the most brilliant students, I can tell you. Uh, in fact, uh, he knew much more uh, than us when we were seniors, to be very honest. Like he was very studious. And uh, then Dr. Prasanna, uh, additional professor in Jipmar Pondicherry, and he is also an office peer in ISNAC. Prasanna, when he joined AIMS, Department of Neuroanesthesia, he was a rebel. He was a rebel with a cause, right? And uh, yeah, sincere salute to him, uh, his hard work. And then uh, in, in third year, when I was in third year, uh, we were joined by a tall, lanky man who was a PT candidate, a service candidate from uh, Kashmir, Dr. Julfi Kar. So today, uh, why uh, this panel discussion? Uh, basically, we want to tell you whether the special, uh, specialization of neuroanesthesia, it does help you in the placement or not, or what are the career prospects in neuroanesthesia or as neuroanesthetist. So from here, I will hand over to Dr. Punaya. So Dr. Punaya, your views, please. Good evening, everybody. Uh, and Dr. Anil, thanks for the introduction. And uh, Dr. Julfi, thanks for this arranging this uh, meeting to discuss about the subspeciality interest and the uh, career growth of students, especially who are pursuing uh, a specialty anesthesia after uh, after they do the MD degree. Uh, <clears throat> many a times, uh, people come and ask whether we need to go for subspecialization it all depends upon uh, one's own interest of course the other thing is about the opportunities uh, around the subspecialization 
as well as uh, as well as the uh, the amount of work which they have watched during the md degree program so in this aspects there are uh, several pros and cons it's not that we are here to tell that and uh, this is the way to go forward there are uh, definitely uh, several pros and uh, there are uh, several uh, cons also for this uh, sub specialization or now the dnb call it a super specialization although it is a super specialization uh, it is not a must that one need to possess a dm degree to practice neuro anesthesiology uh, like in cardiac or like in neurosurgery where without an mch neurosurgery you cannot practice neurosurgery with an ms degree alone uh, we are not evolved to that stage but uh, these are the these are all the preliminary steps which is uh, taken towards those <coughs> those uh, uh, sub specialization uh with respect to the uh, growth in the specialty and with respect to uh, the technical advancements with respect to the familiarity and overall it uh, overall we are seeing the uh, good outcome of the patients so in this regard uh, we need to give a clarity for the md uh, students whether uh, they need to pursue this course and if they need to pursue this course for how long they need to pursue because there are courses which are there only for one year the uh, post doctor fellowship courses which is offered by several institutes as well as uh, by isnac and there are uh, proper uh, dm degree and uh, dnb equivalent degree by the national board for neuroanesthesiology and neurocritical care so which one uh, should they pursue it all depends upon how they want to practice and what is the area they want to practice and whether they want to practice an exclusive neuroanesthesiology or whether they want to practice neurocritical care as well so in this regard i think uh, julfi as a presentation he can uh, brief us on how neuroanesthesiology as a sub specialty has shaped up and how is it being practiced now and what are the future aspects and what should an aspiring student need to know about Uh, getting into this specialty and what are the pros and what are the uh, dr prasanna can also tell about and how the system works in the government and i can little bit tell about how the system works in a corporate or a private sector just dr anil dr anil your mic is in mute yeah i request dr julfikar to start with his presentation uh, and then we can like uh, make up on it so that they get uh, all the participants get a brief idea of the specialty and how the things are uh, yeah so dr julfikar now yeah kindly go ahead thanks yeah thank you dr anil i welcome all of you uh, to this uh, educational initiative this educational initiative we organized together the anesthetist society the Indian Society of Neuroanesthesia and Critical Care and the Neurocritical Care Society of India <clears throat> and the main aim of this activity today is just to make our uh, post graduates in anesthesiology particularly those post graduates who are pursuing a career in future in super specialty just to make them aware as what training skills do we offer in neuroanesthesiology and uh, what are the job prospects once they do their training any course or they gain experience in neuroanesthesiology for a particular period of time <clears throat> in india uh, the various pathways that lead to us uh, as uh, an anesthesiologist once we start practicing as an anesthesiologist mainly we have two types of courses as all of us know that either we do a diploma in anesthesiology which is going to be converted into a masters in anesthesiology as the new uh, format of medical council uh, of india is evolving or we have an md in anesthesiology and only once we have md or in anesthesiology or a diploma in anesthesiology then only we are authorized to give anesthesia to a patient <coughs> however over the last 2 to 3 decades there has been a vast growth in various sub specialties and various sub specialties that have evolved in india because of a large population and a varied requirement of a special skill set 
in India, we have had an evolution of cardiac anesthesiology and neuroanesthesiology along with an evolution in the obstetric anesthesiology, pediatric anesthesiology, and critical care medicine. Our focus of talk will be today to concentrate on the skills of a neuroanesthesiologist. Once we concentrate into this branch, it mainly helps us to improve our skills so that at the end of a particular training period, we help the patient once we get experienced in managing these patients, we get a better understanding of these patients and we try to improve our basic skill pattern. So it helps us in a better patient outcome in terms of reduced morbidity and reduced mortality. And at the same time, if we look at the anesthesiologist, the fellow who is into it, it gives him a better career advancement and definitely it helps him to increase his opportunities in academic as well as in private practice in the corporate sector or in small private practice. And definitely it leads to an increased income potential. Well, uh, this slide, uh, in this slide, we are broadly uh, encompassing as what a neuroanesthesiologist is supposed to do in his day-to-day -day clinical work. The major chunk of a neuroanesthesiologist is in the operating room and in the neurointensive care. Almost he divides his time equally between these two areas. And then if we go outside the operating room in the neuroradiology suit or in the remote, the neuro radio, the neuroanesthetists, he has an increased participation while dealing with various patients. In some centers, particularly in well-developed neuro centers, there is an associated pain clinic because many of the patients they present to these centers and the neuroanesthesiologist is actively involved in various pain procedures for chronic pain management and definitely because uh, neurosciences it's an evolving branch over the last 20 years there's an increased understanding and still because uh, of the novelty because of increasing research that's coming every day. There's a huge potential for our students, for our young students to do research in the field of neurosciences, particularly in the field of neuroanesthesia and neurocritical care. So if we start for the in the operating room, a neuroanesthesiologist, he is trained during his training to deal with a wide variety of patients who are managed <clears throat> in various positions. So perhaps uh, if we see a neuroanesthetist, he, uh, this is the uh, subspeciality where you get to encounter to the management of uh, patients in all varied position. We can have a patient in sitting position, in lateral positions, or in the prone position. And then if we see there's a huge chunk of patients where we deal with particularly the neuro-oncology patients, where we deal with the various tumors, the patients who are having subarachnoid hemorrhage, these patients, they need a special uh, care in terms of management of the fluids, electrolyte mm -hmm. imbalance, particularly vasospasm, subarachnoid hemorrhage. One of the main killers is vasospasm that needs to be taken care of by a neuro intensivist in the post-operative period. And if we see the epilepsy surgery, away craniotomies, they are increasing in number with each progressing day with an improvement in the neurosurgical skills. And then spine surgeries, pituitary surgeries, where the patient is to be managed intraoperatively uh, for various hemodynamic parameters. And in the post-operatively, they have various endocrinopathies in the form of diabetes insipidus, cerebral salt wasting syndrome, syndrome of inappropriate AD excretion, which needs to be meticulously managed. And <clears throat> these are the areas where a neuroanesthesiologist has to be trained during his training course and uh, the patients, they get benefited once he is a 
trained, adequately experienced neurointensivist. There has been a rapid surge in awake neurosurgery in the last decade. And uh, uh, this has become very common, not only in uh, patients who are having uh, tumors or lesions around the various vital areas. Now, many functional surgeries, they are being performed awake. Well, uh, this is one of the patients. This was, he was operated in October, 2019, just few months back. And uh, this patient, he uh, went on to a Facebook Live during his surgery. And this video, it was uh, watched by around 30,000 viewers across the world. So here is where a neuroanesthesiologist plays an active role during surgery in the intraoperative management of this patient. This video is not playing. I'll just try to. <clears throat> Uh, once we come to the pediatric neuroanesthesiology, at some centers, it has emerged as, again, a subspeciality of neuroanesthesiology. Once we deal these patients, they present with a difficult airway where we have to take meticulous care during securing of the airway in these patients. Again, there is a challenge of securing vascular SS managing blood loss, particularly in patients uh, with a scan like this, where we have a huge choroid plexus papilloma. If these patients are not meticulously managed, these patients may sometimes even collapse on the table because of excessive blood loss. And again, if we have patients with craniostenosis, again, these spec this spectrum of patients, they present with both difficult airway management as well as refuse blood loss that has to be managed meticulously. This was one of the patients that was managed recently at our hospital. The size of the head was much, much, uh, the size of the defect was much, much bigger. It was three to four times bigger than the head. And it was mistaken by some of the journalists as a two-headed baby. Again, we have the importance of neuroanesthesiologists. This is summed by one of these slides. Recently, last year, one of the patients, uh, craniophagus, it was operated at All India Institute of Medical Sciences. A team of neurointensivists, neuroanesthesiologists, was meticulously managing these babies for around one to two months. And this resulted in excellent survival. There was both of these babies, as we see in the picture, they have done very well in the post-operative area. This is one of the areas <clears throat> which is one very rewarding to a neuroanesthesiologist. And particularly, I feel these types of surgeries, they may increase in the future. Well, if we uh, see the um, difficult airway, we get a spectrum of patients, particularly with intramedullary lesions and patients who have high cervical cord lesions in the form of atlanto axial sublo uh, subluxations or basilar invag invaginations. This is one of the commonest anomalies that is operated in neurosurgery. And these patients, they require awake fiber optic intubation. And our trainees have to be adequately experienced while dealing with this set of patients. Robotic surgery, it may increase as the days pass. This is a picture from All India Institute of uh, Medical Sciences where uh, we are routinely using robotic surgery 
in the neurosciences uh, center and uh, even uh, there is a coupling of the robotic surgery we use a robot coupled with the oa to achieve a better results particularly in patients who are having various spinal and cranial defects well if we see the neurotrauma neurotrauma is very common india is one of the countries where we have the second highest number of head injuries in the world and head injury being a global epidemic we get an increasing number of uh, head injuries and spinal injuries every day and uh, the skills of a neuroanesthesiologist have to be tuned so as to manage these patients acutely in the operative setup as well as to ensure their optimal outcome they have to be managed meticulously in the intensive care unit and uh, <clears throat> we have a patient we have a uh, an increase in the number of functional neurosurgeries. The functional neurosurgeries, uh, they are increasing worldwide. Now we are doing functional surgeries for Parkinsonism, for various tremor disorders, epilepsies, spasticity, various psychiatric conditions, even for chronic pain. And these patients, they uh, benefit immensely. If we see from this video, this is a person who had this uh, tremor before insertion of the electrode. I'll just play this slide. If we notice meticulously, there is a tremor as he's playing the guitar. And now the electrode is put in at a particular point. And now if we see the improvement, Is some problem <clears throat> with the slides. If we see the uh, post-operative, if we see immediately after the insertion of the electrode, the tremor subsides. There's a smooth, this patient is able to play the guitar very smoothly. Then we come to the intraoperative MRI. Intraoperative MRIs are usually again uh, once we have these patients they present to, with a challenge to the attending anesthesiologist and the attending anesthesiologist has to take care once he is managing these patients in the brain suit one of the domains of a neuroanesthesiologist is his capability to handle the acute neurocare. The acute neurocare, the emphasis of this was laid by the Neurocritical Care Society in the United States of America. And they started the Emergency Neurological Life Support co Course. In India, also, we have started the acute neurocare course. Our society members, particularly Dr. Prasanna and Dr. Punaya, they have put tremendous efforts into this area. And we have come with a beautiful, globally recognized book in the acute neurocare, which has been published by the Springer. And it's a global treatise on the subject. So once we have a neuroanesthesiologist, he has to have the capability to manage the patients who present with acute stroke whether it's ischemic or hemorrhagic then we can have patients who present with status epilepticus subarachnoid hemorrhage or spinal cord injury and in the neuroradiology suit now the order of the day is increasing to more and more endovascular intervention and increased need of a neuroanesthesiologist is being felt in this area and then again stroke we have a stroke patient perhaps in every home at one point of time or the other point of time. And a neuroanesthesiologist role is very vital once we go for a stroke rescue thrombolysis or while dealing with the intensive care management. Again, the presence of a person who is into 
uh, neuroanesthesia, he may help to improve the outcome of a patient who has had a cardiac arrest if we have been trained for a proper post CPR cerebral resuscitation. The second most important component of a training of a neuroanesthesiologist is the neuromonitoring. The basics of neuromonitoring, we have the intracranial pressure monitoring, which was started decades back. And we have to have anesthesiologists who are able to identify the various waves and the various interventions that are required at various particular points of time. And then we have to have anesthesiologists who it is desirable if we train them in doing simple surgical bar holes and insertion of the intraventricular catheters wherever they are desirable. Many a times, non-invasive measures of intracranial pressure measurement are helpful and are becoming the norm of the day. So this is one of the scenarios where an optic nerve sheath diameter is being measured with the use of an ultrasound. And we get to know about the various velocities in the major cerebral vessels by the use of a transcranial Doppler. And a future neuroanesthetist has to be adequately trained in the use of a transcranial Doppler where we insonate way through various windows and we identify the vessels and measure the velocities in the various <coughs> vessels, be it the middle cerebral artery, anterior cerebral artery, posterior cerebral artery, or the posterior circulation. Again, we have to have an educate exposure in the neuromonitoring in terms of evoked potential monitoring. In some surgeries, it has become the standard of care, particularly in the cerebellopontine angles. This is a child where the visual evoked potential monitoring is being measured. Here we have another patient being operated for the posterior fossa tumor where brainstem auditory evoked potential monitoring is done. And another patient here we have being operated for the CP angle tumor, the cerebellopontine angle tumor surgery. And again, he's subjected to the neuromonitoring in order to ensure an optimal neurological outcome in the post-operative period. Another child who's being operated for spinal dysraphism with an educate neuromonitoring in situ. We have to, to have an optimal outcome. We have to ensure and educate cerebral oxygenation and various monitors in terms of near infrared spectroscopy and brain tissue oxygen monitoring. They are being used to maintain an optimal cerebral oxygenation, particularly in the intensive care unit. And at some centers in India, right now we are using at All India Institute of Medical Sciences, the cerebral microdialysis uh, in experimental settings. Maybe in the near future, it may be introduced into a clinical setting also to ensure to improve the patient outcome. The transesophageal echocardiography, it's used increasingly in the sitting position to detect particularly the venous air embolism. And uh, it helps to differentiate various, uh, various uh, it helps to differentiate, it helps in detection of the air, particularly during the sitting position. Neurocritical care, is one of the main domains of uh, neuroanesthesiology. If we see any intensive care setting, almost 50 to 60%, perhaps more at many times, uh, of the patients, they are admitted with problems 
that are neurological in nature. And if we have an anesthetist who is adequately trained in the management of such patients, there may be a better outcome of such patients. In the neurocritical care, a neuroanesthesiologist is being trained in the management of traumatic brain injury, spinal cord injury, subarachnoid hemorrhage, and then there are various medical comorbidities in terms of myasthenia gravis, Guillain-Barre syndrome, status epilepticus, meningitis, and cephalitis. And stroke is one of the most common diseases. And these are the main areas that a neuroanesthesiologist has to look after, whether he is having a proper fluid and electrolyte balance, what should be the levels of various fluids, electrolytes in such neurological patients, whether he's getting an optimal cerebral oxygenation, can we use any cerebral protective measures? How to manage cerebral vasospasm? Do are we giving an, a, a drugs in a, an optimal way to ensure educate seizure control seizures? They can devastate these patients and can have a very bad outcome. And then how to manage the various crosstalks that are going between the brain and the various organs. And lastly, there's a huge chunk of neurological patients who presented with various endocrinopathies, how to anticipate these endocrinopathies and how to manage these endocrinopathies. To lay emphasis on this, an initiative was developed by the Indian Society of Neuroanesthesia and Critical Care. We started with the parallel sister society, the Neurocritical Care Society of India. And, uh, in coming few days, from 2nd to 4th October, we are having the first virtual conference. Uh, many of our uh, young postgraduates, they can participate in this conference and perhaps they can have an idea of what all domains a neurointensivist, a neuroanesthesiologist delves into in his day-to-day -day clinical work. Pain management is being practiced at many neurocenters and some of the blocks that the neuroanesthetist is uh, adequately experienced in or should gain experience is the Gesserian ganglion block where we go even up to the clivus and we, uh, this is at my center, why do we do, we are not doing right now uh, a radiofrequency ablation are giving glycerol rhizolysis, but at many centers, radiofrequency ablation is a better modality of treatment that is practiced. Steeled ganglion block, it's used for CRPS patients, complex regional pain syndromes, and at the same time, we use it widely for the patients who present with cerebral vasospasm. And then in some patients, we may go for a cervical epidural and low back pain patients where we can go for both diagnostic and therapeutic pain procedures, starting from ozonucleolysis, percutaneous disectomy, or advanced skills in the form of percutaneous vertebroplasties. Research is one of the pivotal roles, neurosciences being an evolving branch where we still have an increased understanding over the last few years, but still the subject is evolving. And if we have, if we keep an eye on our patients and observe them, their clinical scenario, we can come with various research ideas, which may translate into various studies. We have some various platforms for our youngsters. Our society is publishing a journal, Journal of Neuroanesthesiology and Critical Care, which is an index journal with uh, some of the indexing agencies. We are trying to achieve an indexation with PubMed. And then we have Journal of Neurosurgical Anesthesiology and Neurocritical Care, which publish many of the studies in neuroanesthesiology and neurocritical care. Well, uh, 
what are the institutes in india that offer the training in neuroanesthesiology at neurocritical care these are some of the apical institutes which have started the dm course in neuroanesthesia and critical aims new delhi all india institute of medical sciences new delhi and sri chitra tirunal institute of medical sciences and technology they were the pioneers these were the two institutes where dm was started new hands at the same time they started uh, way back 15 20 years back they started a pdcc in neuroanesthesiology this is again one of the pivotal institutes in neuroanesthesiology and critical care and now we have a dm course in new hands for last 4 to 5 years and the pgi chandigarh jipmer pondicherry we have started uh, dm in neuroanesthesia neuroanesthesiology in la for last 2 to 3 years and recently we have started dm in aims rishikesh aims bhopal and aims bhubaneswar again right now at this point of time we have post doctoral certificate course in neuroanesthesia and critical care for one year in nimhans bangalore again in sri chitra institute of medical sciences trivandrum we have sanjay gandhi post graduate institute lucknow and banaras hindu university varanasi and this year again uh, aligarh muslim university they have started a pdcc in neuroanesthesia and critical care then for last 2 to 3 years we have started dnb neuroanesthesia and critical care a 3 years course which is equivalent to dm course uh we have started these courses in uh, jipmer the gb pant the govind balab pant institute of uh, medical science medical education and research institute in new delhi we have sher kashmir institute of medical sciences srinagar and then we have many corporate hospitals apollo hospital hyderabad global hospital and health stitchinai indra parastha apollo hospital new delhi we have institute of neurosciences kolkata and we have kokila bin dhirubani ambani hospital and medical research institute medanta haryana and we have hinduja national hospital mumbai paras hospital gurgaon cm civil or and in all these hospitals we have reputed trained neuroanesthetists who impart training who to our youngsters and they are generating a dedicated neuro critical care neuroanesthesia force that's spreading across the country and across the world then we have our society is putting intensive efforts into it, disseminating the knowledge of neurosciences across the country for last 20 years and 20 to 30 years our uh, our uh, mentors dr dash dr umameshwar raw they have put intensive efforts and it's the result of these efforts that snack started various fellowships in neuroanesthesia and neurocritical this is a one year fellowship for our youngsters so currently we have this fellowship it's running in fortis memorial research institute gurgaon we have max super specialty hospital saket Institute of Neurosciences, Kolkata, and we have Rahman Hospital, Guwahati, Park Clinic, Kolkata, Max Super Specialty Hospital, Dehradun, and we have uh, Kokilabai Dhirubani Ambani Hospital, Mumbai, Hinduja National Hospital, Mumbai, and we have this year Vadodara Institute of Neurological Sciences. They have joined the club in training a dedicated force of the neuroscience. scientists we have uh, recently started within last 2 to 3 years a neuro critical care fellowships aims new delhi and nimhans bangalore they have been the pioneers in developing a one year dedicated neuro critical care fellowships and uh, again we have snack fellowships which are being run by Apollo Bangalore Institute of uh, Neurosciences Kolkata and Max Super Speciality Hospital so these are the training opportunities for our young generation and uh, that's uh, where i end my talk today
I hand over the yeah. proceedings to Dr. Anil. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Julpikar. And uh, connecting from Kashmir, we were not very sure like how will be the net connections and all, but uh, a very nice presentation giving deep insight into speciality, uh, super speciality of neuroanesthesia as well as the options available along with the training centers. Uh, before we go into further discussion, uh, uh, I would like to thank Dr. H.S. Das, uh, uh, without whom uh, this speciality would not have been uh, what it is today. He is a pioneer, he is a founder father, like who started it all at a center in Ames, and he became the center chief also. Uh, we are lucky to have him to, today. Uh, I think he's watching this live. Sir, it's a privilege to have you uh, with us on the program. It was under your watchful eyes that we all were trained. And uh, Dr. Pramod Bithal, needless to say, uh, both the professors were there always to see that they not only impart the best training, uh, give the best knowledge, but also the best uh, of the culture, that uh, culture of uh, aims, basically, punctuality, dedication, and sincerity towards the patient. Uh, we are joined today here on this program. I, I know that Dr. Girja is also there. And uh, again, uh, Dr. K.J. Chaudhary, uh, who is the head of the department of anesthesia at Apollo Hospital, one of the very sincere neuroanesthetists, uh, who is again very eager to contribute to the speciality, super speciality of neuroanesthesia. Uh, Dr. Anil Parekh, uh, again, a very senior neuroanesthetist from Mumbai is also watching this, as I can make out. Uh, so these are the people, actually, this is how the things are done. I remember Dr. Dash is one person who not only sees that his students pass out, but they also get settled in very premium institutes. You go anywhere and uh, at any good center of urinacy and critical care, there will be a student of his who will be there as the center chief. And the same quality is being maintained. Uh, we were really lucky to be trained under him, uh, and uh, I, I can assure you that the best quality in urine anesthetists were produced at AIMS during his tenure. And I think Puneya is one example, and he can vouch for it. So how uh, this super specialty of anesthesia, basically as a carrier, is in private sector? First, I go to Puneya. Puneya, can you share your uh, experience of a neuro anesthetist uh, in a private sector institute? How like? You got the Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Anil. Uh, I think uh, Choudhury sir is here. Uh, Dr. Anil Parak is here. They are the pioneers uh, in the metro cities when the neuroanesthesiology as a subspeciality or a super specialty when it was started. And as you all know, <clears throat> once we were doing neuroanesthesiology. Uh, of course, in the metros, there were a lot of opportunities. In the corporate sectors, people always wanted neuroanesthesiology because they were doing a lot of cases and they wanted a dedicated neuroanesthesia team to look after those cases. When we go out, actually, when the fresher completes, still today, definitely, when you compare uh, with the general, uh, uh, you should not call a general a specialty anesthesia team doing. Uh, doing all general anesthesia and dedicated neuro center, definitely the opportunities are still there and still it is growing up. It's not only in the metros. Now, if you can see in the last three years, what we are seeing is that even in uh, tier two cities, uh, the neurosurgery has gone to a level where they have uh, dedicated endoscopy, they have dedicated a uh, uh, department for neurosurgery and uh, neurocritical care. And people prefer uh, a dedicated neuroanesthesia team to look after the neurocritical care as well. So definitely the opportunity as of today, if you can see, we need a lot of neuroanesthetists in this country to fill in the gap. And most of the centers do not have a dedicated neuroanesthetist, although there are experienced anesthesiologists who are covering neuroanesthesiology and experienced intensivists who are covering the neurocritical care. If we add a dedicated neuroanesthetist that will give an entirely different dimension to the care. You might see, you might say that you know, even before he came, the system was working. We were doing neurosurgeries, we were doing neurocritical care, but it will not be the same. Just trust me, it will give an entirely different dimension. If you can see uh, in terms of an acute stroke service or an acute trauma service or new neuro trauma service managing head injury. You can see in all these cases, you know, you know, the time is brain. That's what we call time is brain. So putting in a dedicated system with an uh, with a with a specialized uh, 
person in place and a dedicated system of care will definitely improve the outcome of the patients that uh, that we have seen in our practice when, when we started our practice it was very difficult for us to create a big team because when you know when you when you go for neuroanesthesia what the management will expect is how one person can manage you know all the day maybe their cases may not be too high to accommodate some six to seven people to form a team and practice neuroanesthesia so depending on the situation we need to adapt maybe if the if they are doing about 10 to 12 cases per month then we have to work differently if the center is performing 30 to 40 cases per month and there is a dedicated neurocritical care unit then it can work differently or if the center is doing 60 to 80 cases per month and uh, there are uh, a huge uh, input of neuro emergency cases then you have to frame the department uh, uh, separately we have not reached a stage where you you say that and it is like a cardiology or a endocrinology or a uh, or a, a neurology or a neurosurgery uh, we can have only dm uh, candidates or a dnb uh, candidates to run the neuroanesthesia surgeries we have not reached to that level but still you can run a dedicated service depending upon the place where you practice you have to see the number of cases you know what they do under the uh, the icu how the pattern of icu works whether it is a general intensivist who's taking care of all the patients or you want to create a dedicated neuro icu maybe even if it is four or six beds to start with definitely it will make a huge difference in the outcome of those patients so uh, we have to see the ground reality we have to see how the hospital is functioning uh, once you go inside and disturb the whole system, the others may not like it. The other anesthesiologists, seniors who are already practicing the work uh, uh, may not like it. You need to go and talk to them. You need to talk to the surgeons. You need to talk to the uh, ER physicians, the neurologists, and then you have to create a team. Uh, it will take some time, but uh, definitely when, once you start, it will uh, happen and it will work. And we have seen in our practice in so many centers how it has uh, made a huge change and then how it has uh, made a huge impact on the outcome of these patients. And one most important thing is that in the coming years, uh, just mark my words, neurocritical care will be a pivotal role in that you will not only be an anesthetist or an intensivist, you will be a primary care provider. So that is how the future is shaping up, especially with respect to neuroemergencies, may it be subarachnoid hemorrhage or a ICH or a status epilepticus or a trauma, head injury, spinal cord injury, you will have a role to play as a primary care physician because you know in this neurocritical care, there should be a person who should play a pivotal role. A surgeon, a surgeon will come in and go, an, inter an interventional radiologist will come in and go to the procedure, a neurologist might come in and go, a neurosurgeon will come in and go, and this neurointensivist will play a pivotal role uh, starting from the emergency care till the patient, the patient has been discharged to rehab and to home, and then uh, uh, in the critical care outreach services also, they'll play a very important role, and this will definitely uh, have a huge impact on the outcome of these patients. Okay, thanks, Daniel. Yes, thanks for giving your viewpoint. And uh, now I come to Dr. Prasanna. So how was it like when you entered Tipmas? Uh, was there a separate department? Uh, what were the problems which you encountered in having a separate division of your anesthesiology? What was the scenario like? And what are the prospects in the government sector? Yeah, uh, when we look at the history of neurosurgery, in the last 70, uh, 70 years or so, it has uh, grown tremendously. It has become more complex, more and more complex procedures are being uh, operated and more critically ill patients are being treated. So there is a development of neurocritical care units in the last two to three decades. So as this has progressed neurosurgery, the anesthesia has also progressed. You can say as the more complex neurosurgery has become, the anesthesia has also evolved. Similarly, because of the evolvement in anesthesia, even they are able to perform the complex neurosurgical procedures with much more safety and effectively. So vice versa, if you see, both are going hand in hand. So when we look at the history of the, this training in neuroanesthesia in India, the PDF or the fellowship courses were running before the development of DM. So initially it was felt a one-year course, which was sufficient, which was being run, I think, in Nimhans and Trichitra Institute in Prevendram. 
slowly it was felt that there is a pressing need to start a course a formal training course of 3 years which will not only help in the management of this patient but it will also help in the development of a proper protocol based training in india as well as it will help in improvement of the research which is one of the most important aspect of education so it was felt that there is a pressing need to start a dm course and the most pivotal role was taken by these three institutes aims srichitra and nimhans so these were the three institutes which pitched in initially it was started in aims and srichitra nimhans had some issues but ultimately nimhans pgi started the next pg and nimhans started the dm courses now it has spread to the other aims and also in jipmer since last two years we have started so when i joined the institute in jipmer the work was less eventually there were two neurosurgeons which now we have six neurosurgeons and the work is much more with a uh, waiting period of almost 2 years for us of the patients so with the development of the course the training improves the knowledge improves and the education improves then there is also a question that what should be done in some of the centers where the workload is not much okay so what i would say with my personal experience with my training the neuro anesthesia training also helps you to evolve as a good anesthesiologist so that even if you have to do the some of the specialty cases then also your knowledge about the case and the physiology improves because of proper understanding of the cerebral physiology so what i would say you can be a inter- anesthetist if you want to be a general anesthetist or you can be a specialty anesthetist still having a specialized interest in neuro anesthesia also so both so we have many centers now in the government sectors which are doing very well in fact few of the state medical colleges if you see the recent recruitments they have specifically announced for the department of neuro anesthesia professor post assistant professor and associate professor post so many departments have division of neuro anesthesia working under department of anesthesiology with full harmony and cooperation that is very important if you see there is no fight and at the end of the day we are all anesthesiologists we are proving our roles and we are spe- having a special interest for example if you see in the general anesthesia there are many people who are interested in pediatric anesthesia there are many people who are interested in regional anesthesia similarly i see a very good coordination compassion between the colleagues between the neuro anesthesiology and the speciality speciality anesthesiologist that is one of the important find what i am able to observe in the last 10 years yes over to you anil yeah thanks again yes. uh, so i think those viewers who are in a dilemma basically uh, fresh pass out the post graduates the dnb yes. the md uh, i think this perspective of like whether to join your anesthesia and how to join and where to join is clear uh i will just like to add uh, with my experience of isnac basically uh i think this is one of the very few societies who is genuinely and regularly conducting educational programs certificate courses practical training you just have to be on the lookout of their ads unfortunately this is corona time otherwise they were regularly uh, holding these practical workshops at various centers throughout india and a wonderful work has been done by isnac i really congratulate isnac for that and uh, again uh, uh, i i re- uh, request dr dash and all the seniors to have their blessings on us and blessings with us so with your sincere uh, blessings i think sir we continue to progress just to again highlight one more thing that this is not limited to india uh, uh, this isnac and uh, neuroanesthesia society and uh, basically people from aims they have gone abroad dr deepak sharma is one example like he is doing very good in us uh dr girja just uh, i think sir has become an uh, office bearer of snack so sumul is doing very good in canada so uh, this is what i remember uh, being an alumni of aims uh, and many others are there in other parts of world so it's not limited this specialty is not, uh, not limited only to india but the trained people from these centers are making their mark all across the world so get trained by them you will be definitely be at an advantage So with these remarks, I think we conclude this session. Thanks for having a wonderful session. Thanks, Jhulpikar, for joining us all the way from Kashmir. Thank you, Dr. Anil. Yeah. 
and thanks for nia and thanks to uh, prasanna for making it happen and looking forward to thank you dr anil for such cooperation uh, so that uh, we can take care of our fellow nsp thank you very much thanks thank you and with that i add thank you dr anil thank you thank you